Well, hello, here we go into the last chapter of our textbook on ethics and persuasion and influence and advertising and how should we go about trying to persuade others to get them to think like us, do what we do, stop doing what we don't think they should do. How is that boundary between their freedom and our opportunity to persuade or influence them. Where are the lines between that? So, anyway, I'm going to skip that first slide there. And so the question is, is persuasion unethical? Now, there are those who would say, and the textbook actually began this way, talking about those who would say, well, all forms of persuasion are unethical because they share a certain bias that we may not agree with, they may not be completely forthcoming, all sorts of shortcomings in the process of trying to be persuasive. And so some unethical uh, issues are that it involves deceit, beguilement, trickery, dishonesty, they're not telling us the full truth, which I think is uh, likely often true, but not necessarily always true. Uh, persuasion as manipulation that we are wanting somebody to do what we want them to do to fulfill our goals, dreams, expectations, and we have insufficient regard for the person uh, we are using, so we are basically taking advantage of them. Then they have also the feminist view, persuasion as is a masculine approach, uh, patriarch patriarchal pat practice that those who have the power and are in, in control are calling the shots and then just working to line everyone else up to do their bidding. But I think they add an interesting thought here that all those views are in themselves being persuasive. And so a person who is attempting to convince others that persuasion, uh, that persuasion is unethical is persuading itself. So by uh, definition that would make their persuasive attempts unethical as well but anyway that's kind of a trap that we fall into okay the textbooks view of persuasion they use this tool analogy which is an amoral view that tools a hammer is a hammer and you can use it to hammer nails or uh, break your piggy bank or your brother's piggy bank uh, so it's, it's all how you use it. It's all how, what you do with what is there. And they would say that persuasion is fine as long as it's following ethical guidelines. But then you have to ask whose ethical guidelines? The authors, ours, the Bibles, uh, an amoral society, any, everybody's personal guidelines. How do we do that? Uh, and they point out that, you know, this idealistic view of communication that people say what they want directly, clearly. They make sure that the other person understands and feeds back and communicates back to them. They say the reality is that just doesn't happen most of the time. Uh, communication breaks down. People have incompatible goals. They disagree. They fight. They argue. And they will uh, change to different unethical strategies to get what they want. So uh, persuasion in itself is not a dirty word. It just so often is used unfairly and inappropriately. And then this little chart, it's all about the motive. Uh, the motive of the persuader more than the strategy is what makes something a persuasive attempt, a persuasive at act more or less uh, ethical. And, you know, use of deception. Is it okay to lie to somebody to get them to come to a surprise birthday party? Uh, is that ethical? Where, in, and you compare it, yeah, we, we look at that and we say, well, com compared to swindling a senior adult out of money, one is certainly more ethical uh, than the other. And on face value, we see that. But when it comes to the absolute recognition of telling the truth, uh, they both are deceptive, but it's the, the goal that makes the uh, difference there. Use of fear appeals, trying to get your child to never accept a ride from a stranger or yelling at them when they step out in the street to make them stop. 
uh, again, that's fear appeal. We're uh, trying to move them based on scaring them. Uh, but is that ethical? And then the use of ingratiation. The difference between trying to schmooze someone to get them to like us, to do what we want them to do, versus uh, trying just to cheer someone up for some situation at hand. So, uh, again, you know, where do you draw the line? Who makes the rules? So then they, then they identify, the authors identify a list of questionable, questionable ethics situations where you can see what's happening, but it's kind of like in that gray zone. Hate speech, verbal aggression, cyberbullying. Some of these are probably a little more clear. Trolls, bots, guilt by association, hearsay, innuendo, you know, throwing out messages. You're not directly saying something, but you are uh, leaving people open to believe or not believe. Uh, this level of ambu am am ambiguity that you are launching into the conversation. And then uh, these different all political strategies of whisper campaigns, false equivalents that you're comparing your opponent with Hitler. And maybe they both had mustaches and therefore anybody with a mustache is suspect. Uh, dog whistle politics, push polling, where you are uh, taking polls, but actually seeking to influence through the actual process of taking the poll. Example of this would be Rick Warren at his church, um, uh, uh, the church at Saddleba Saddleback Valley. I'm blanking out, uh, out on the name there, Saddleback Valley Community Church. Uh, he says one of the things that when he first started the church, he would go out and do polls with the neighbors to find out what they were looking for in a church. But he was not only trying to, so, you know, is it an ethical issue? He wasn't just trying to get their information, but he was hoping to build contacts and relationships. And then when he started the church, he now had a base to work from and to invite them to church and hope they would come. So maybe that's, you know, certainly not the same thing, but uh, the, that polling is, is trying to get them to come to church and not only just garner their information and data. Uh, moral exclusion is where we take the high road, or we, we see ourselves as taking the high road and the others as taking the low road. Whether it's accurate or not is another question, but we kind of say we are superior, they are inferior. Characteristics that the authors point out. He, the, he says these are some measurement tools to identify whether uh, an approach, a method of persuasion is ethical or not. First of all, intentionality. Are, do, is there is your purpose of trying to persuade clear? It's nothing wrong with persuading. Sometimes it's a matter of just being clear about it. We are wanting you to buy our product. I'm listening to all these car commercials these days, and they're saying, you know, we are here for you. We care about you, which they probably do, but that we're also trying to sell you a car. <laughs> so even if in this time of of uh, turmoil in culture, uh, if you need a car, we are here for you. So they're trying to do both, send both messages at the same time, and I guess that's okay as long as you're clear. The the authors also point out this issue of of unintended consequences that sometimes we just aren't as careful with our words and messages go out even though we did not intend to mislead or deceive or to uh, cloud the issue but sometimes it ends up happening in spite of our best intentions and do we need to be responsible to clean up any mess we may, may have unintentionally created through our persuasive attempts uh, the conscious awareness of all, that everybody knows what's going on. We say, we are here to sell you a car. We think we can sell you a car at a great price, a great car. We will give you great service. That's pretty straightforward. So the, the consumer knows what they are uh, hopefully going to actually get, and the advertiser or seller is making very clear their intention. Free choice, free will, free decisions. Is it up to us to make the decision, or are we being duped and uh, with dishonesty? Language-based approaches is superior to uh, images, for example, that images leave a lot more ambiguity, unclearness in what they're trying to convey. Language has much more precision 
So they are encouraging, uh, if not choosing language-based persuasion over image-based, for example, at least both and, not, not just the imagery. And reliance on central processing. Uh, using our thinking, critiquing, evaluating, and not just being, uh, you do not just using peripheral of how we feel or emotionally driven or um, the colors or the uh, number of sources used in a presentation as the primary deciding factors of what we decide. But that's the same thing, that language-based, as we just said, is central processing primarily. It doesn't have to be. Where other forms of persuasion may not be language-based and thus may not be central, uh, promoting central processing. Uh, the presumptive superiority of words over images. We just already mentioned that. And here we go back to what they just were talk, what I was just mentioning about central versus peripheral. Uh, I think we might have covered everything there. Peripheral promotes mental shortcuts uh, rather than thinking things all the way through. Low level of receiver involvement. We just either receive the message rather than asking questions, uh, checking things out on the internet, following up on what the presenter said and did. And how involved are we with the uh, persuasion process going on? Also, just an acknowledgement of cultural differences. That individualistic cultures like the United States, Germany, I think Canada, but sometimes that may not be accurate, but at least U.S. and Germany are more individualistic oriented, where Asian cultures tend to be more collectivist in nature and they tend to favor indirect strategies uh, versus direct strategies. They would talk about, you know, wanting to save face so they don't want to put someone in a position where they have to say yes or no and possibly turn somebody down and lose face in that uh, loss of face, and uh, they would therefore uh, be more embarrassed losing face and therefore they would choose a route that says that would be use hinting for example as a method of persuasion rather than direct statements of you should do this or that. So a couple of analogies that the authors present um, persuaders as lovers. Uh, Brock Reed, it might be Brock Ride, uh, has had an analogy of the types of arguers and he says uh, Basic, this is based on what level of regard do you have for other people? Do you have high regard or low regard for others? And we start low and work our, our way up. Uh, he, and he uses these three terms of seducers, rapists, and lovers. Rather odd terms, but in this, in this uh, scenario. He says you, seducers have low regard for others and use charm, deception, flattery, whatever works to get people to believe us and follow us and do what we are asking them to do, but they have low regard for us, that we are just pawns to be uh, manipulated. Rapists may be even less uh, regard in that they are going to do what they do and get what they want by force. A uh, use of uh, power, coercion, threat, ultimatums, punishment, uh, anything that, that will get us to do it. There, there are no uh, limitations. At least seducers were trying to deceive us where rapists force us. You know, much, not much of an ethical uh, shift there, but there is a distinction. And lovers say they view others as partners. People you work with, not work on or uh, manipulate, but you're partners in the process. And so the authors said, let's take that over and carry it on to apply it to persuasion and so three characteristics first of all respect so acknowledging the value and significance and worth of the other person that we don't take advantage of them because they are people of value and as Christians we would certainly understand uh, that approach equality that we all see ourselves as equal 
uh, equal status, shared goals, power is not the issue here. We are trying to be uh, persuasive without uh, power manipulation by forcing somebody to do something they really don't want to do. And intolerance is even if somebody disagrees with us, we agree to disagree agreeably. I've heard that said many times and, and we ourselves remain open that maybe they have something that we can learn from. Maybe we don't know everything after all. So those are three uh, positive characteristics and I would agree with those. Uh, Cialdini's ethical approach, kind of the same idea, different little, different little angle, but again, using these uh, unique words in a persuasion uh, context. Uh, bunglers are people who might be ethically inappropriate in their persuasion just by uh, stupidity, basically, that they are uh, ineffective because they don't know better. That doesn't mean they're innocent. It just means they haven't worked hard to know their craft, and so they may be offending others, wounding others, taking advantage of others by uh, ineptness. Smugglers are those who know what they're doing and they're doing it anyway. They are trying to deceive and mislead in order to move a uh, client into a situation where they can give the smuggler what they want. They're trying to sneak it in. Con artists, hucksters, high pressure salespeople, the whole thing. But sleuths, that's kind of the preferred approach to persuasion is these are folks who have done their homework. They know their craft, they've studied, they've critiqued, they've learned, they've read, they've listened, they've watched to try to get better at what they do. And so they're knowledgeable about persuasion. They use the right strategy and with ethical uh, boundaries being one of their guidelines. And then depending on who their listener is, who their audience is, who their clients are, they adapt the message to fit the person to make a better impact on them. And they give the examples of TED Talks and Steve Jobs' commencement address, which you haven't heard that, you probably should listen to that. But these are people who know their audience and approach them appropriately. So then we, I think is now, I'm going to check something here. Uh, we're going into just different scenarios that the throughout the textbook, the authors have touched on all these items before, but now they're kind of bringing it together in this whole area of ethics uh, so we can see them in one kind of fell swoop. So the first one is, is coercion ever justified? Is it appropriate to, at some level, uh, trick, fool, force, somebody to do something or not do something because we have concluded ethically it is better for them uh, that they would listen to what we say. You know, for children, a child on their own is never going to go get a vaccination, but the parents have decided we believe that's what's best for them and uh, they're going to then force them, quote unquote, to get the vaccination. I've had vaccinations. If you haven't, you should get one. Uh, so is that they being coercive or just, you know, I'm still alive. So a uh, person who is having some kind of psychological breakdown, is it beneficial to call the, uh, I think they're still, they're called a pet team, psychological evaluation team that they would send out from a local hospital to evaluate a person even against their will. And uh, they have this 20, 48 hour lockup where someone may be forced uh, to go into a uh, holding area at a local hospital for 48 hours before they need to see a judge and may be released. Uh, but they're not going to choose to go to that lockup, but they would do that because it's better for them and uh, somebody's made an ethical decision to force them to do that. Uh, the ticking time bomb, the ticking, well, the ticking bomb, where somebody's life is threatened, a kidnapping situation, and we have probably have seen this on a thousand different uh, television shows, where they only have so much time and they have to threaten somebody who has information that can lead to the saving of the person who's been kidnapped. Uh, can you torture that person? 
Is that appropriate to get the information in a life or death situation? Um, and then enhanced interrogation techniques. A few years ago, it was this whole thing about waterboarding as a way of getting people to uh, talk. And during the uh, Iraqi war, that was an issue. You might be too young to remember all that, but you never know. Okay, ethical questions regarding source credibility. In other words, just because somebody is talking about a product or a situation does not make them an expert on that topic. And should we listen to them? Should they be allowed to do that? Uh, is it unethical for a celebrity to endorse a product they've never used? Should they have had to use it before they endorse it? Um, and is that too, like if you love a certain football player and that certain football player is endorsing a product, is that unfair influence? Uh, do they have to disclose their relationship with the uh, product? Are they paid? Is it a paid endorsement or do they do it free of quality? Well, of course, they're going to get paid. They wouldn't do it otherwise. doesn't mean they don't use it, but you also should know they're being paid. And do they should they be have to bon be a bona fide user of the product that it's proven that they've used that product before i've noticed on amazon uh when they're doing evaluations of books uh it'll say you know certified purchase of the book in other words they didn't get it for free but they actually paid money to get that book now how accurate that is i don't know but um uh, you have to decide that. I usually don't bother. I read the evaluations, but I make my own decision. Okay, a couple of situations where uh, certain groups may be less uh, skilled, able to make good, objective, solid decisions, and may be unduly influenced by persuaders. They talk about children and senior adults. Uh, what guidelines should be followed when it, when we are attempting to persuade children? And children may believe that all the ads they see are truthful and honest, and they may not be free giveaways like a free toy in a box of cereal. Does that make that cereal better tasting or uh, more healthy or whatever? No, it doesn't matter. Just give me that box with a toy in it. And uh, then there's also the issue of children viewing adult advertising that may not be appropriate for them um, so then senior adults they're more likely they say to fall into deceptive prize promotions lottery scams uh, bank error scams there's a commercial out now for these reverse mortgages which I don't fully understand but uh, the celebrity is talking about he says I wouldn't be here advertising if this wasn't fair and I would never do it if any senior adults were being taken advantage of and so you're supposed to believe the advertiser uh, that they're not taking advantage of seniors although other situations uh, do so uh, but we are taking the more vulnerable and trying to protect them uh, other groups inner city residents non-English speakers, underage drinkers, and smokers are all seen as vulnerable groups and that could be influenced. Uh, the placing of uh, liquor stores in particular neighborhoods and the use of, of advertising for cigarettes and alcohol in certain areas and, and less in other areas. So is that fair? Is that right? Is that appropriate? Should there be something more done about to um, look into that situation? Uh, the female body image. Now, gentlemen, they may have uh, the same issues. It's just they're not as maybe as well known about uh, body image and all that. And does that make some more vulnerable to advertising certain products or resources or gyms or diets or whatever are some in our culture more vulnerable to f try to find a solution or what they would think is, is a solution. Uh, advertising. So they have these four statements about they sell us dreams 
that makes us believe that there is a quick fix, and that's usually the issue I've, I've heard uh, about weight loss, which <laughs> maybe I should pay more attention, but that they say, you know, it's going to take you probably just as long to take it off as it did to put it on. So beware of any advertising that is telling you something different than that. And you probably, if you take it off slowly, you probably learn more discipline than if you take it off and then you put it right back on. Uh, I'm not an expert in ever in uh, dieting or by any means, but uh, they also not only do they do we want things to be better for us in terms of things like dieting or education, but also things that we desire that may be more uh, the more base elements of life that they're telling us how we can get those things that we may um, even though we know they're bad for us. Okay, I'm going to stop this. Uh, oh, let me do this last one. Advertisers manipulate us into wanting things we really don't need. How true is that? I'm debating right now, since I will be teaching more at home to improve my home teaching situation. I know I've got to get a new laptop coming up, a new MacBook. But also, do I want to improve my screen size here at home? Uh, my Do I want to go wireless on my keyboard and all those things? And so I'm not seeing advertising directly, but I'm going to be diving into looking for these products and uh, these I think I think I need them so maybe I'm j I'm not talking about the same thing here but I certainly want these things also I love gimmicks I'm uh, gizmos when it comes to uh, technology so I have to be careful when I'm entering into that world okay I'm going to stop here and start a new video because this one's probably just getting too long